So let's talk about crossovers. Mm -hmm. Crossovers in speakers, I would think are, well, the, you know, the limited experience I have in designing things, the toughest place because uh, we, we know that a crossover is designed so that the woofer doesn't try and reproduce what the tweeter does and, and vice versa, mm -hmm. or the mid-range. But mm -hmm. at the point where they meet, mm -hmm. I correct me if I'm wrong, but don't we have things going in and out of phase and mm -hmm. cancellations? And, and a lot of people in the camp of full range drivers mm -hmm. would say that crossovers are the worst part of any speaker and, mm -hmm. and, and should be avoided, yet mm -hmm. every speaker out there for the 99% has some type of two-way, three-way, four-way crossover. So talk a little bit about the art of designing crossovers and, and are they really as bad as people tend to think they are at those crossover points? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, speakers started uh, with cone drivers as full-range drivers. So it was a single cone speaker, yay big, reproducing all the frequencies it, it could. And later on, we've now moved to having you know, the most common being a, a, a midwoofer and a tweeter with a crossover. So the, the, in the camp of full range speakers, you have a lower cost. I mean, it's only a single drive unit and not the cost of the crossover components um, or additional amplification if it's an active system. But the reason why why you've gone that way is it's hard to make a single driver full range that, that sounds good. And the reason why is, um, you know, there are proponents of them, but to make them physically large enough to play bass the uh, cleanly, you end up having narrower than optimal directivity at high frequencies. So above what's known as KA2, which is the diameter divided by the, I'm sorry, the circumference divided by the frequency, um, you end up having, uh, basically when waves start getting to the size of the, the cone, they start becoming directional. And so with a four inch woofer above about five kilohertz, this gets to be laser beam uh, narrow. And so the, and a four inch woofer isn't particularly large for, right, for, for bass. So, you don't get a lot of bass out of it. Right, so the, it's kind of a necessary evil to have a crossover. And the, whenever you have a non-coincident source, so you have a woofer and a tweeter, at some points in space, they're going to combine, and in other points in space, they're going to cancel. And so you have what's called a lobe. So if you look at it in cross-section, there's an area of cancellation between the two drivers based on their physical offsets and the frequency because of the phase issues you're talking about. Um, and so they can't be in phase at all frequencies at all angles. And you know, that's one of the arguments for coincidental or coaxial speakers is that there's there's less lobing, but then you also have issues with reflections and things like that. So in a traditional speaker, yeah, the crossover, it gets filtering out resonances, it's filtering out distortion, and it's, um, it's also combined summing those, the outputs of the, those drivers. So it's very important, and that gives a lot of the, the sound uh, of the speaker. There's been some, um, I guess, misinformation about passive crossovers that, oh, you're throwing away half of the power, you know, into the crossover components themselves and it's not making it to the, the drive units. And I think where that came from was, you know, in, in some cases you're having to pad down the, the tweeter and upper mid-range response of a, of a system in order to, to blend them. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't want to have a non-flat response anyway. So, you know, you, you're, you're throwing away the things that you, you want to throw away uh, and, and tailoring the response for it to sound good. So it's, it's, not, it's not, you know, hurting the performance per se. You're, you're filtering out the stuff you don't want. Well, and so it, a simple crossover, mm -hmm. like if we're just crossing over the tweeter, yeah. we might just put a capacitor, yeah, right? Yeah. And, that, and that makes a high-pass filter. Sure, sure. So, but then we hear about, uh, mm -hmm. oh, 12 dB, 24 sure, dB. Sure. Why would we choose a very steep crossover that has many components as opposed sure. to a simple one? Yeah, so the, the um, excursion of a drive unit actually stays constant with a 12 dB per octave filter going down. So you're actually still, um, you, you know, with, with only, if the, the tweeter's only rolling off at 6 dB per octave below, with a single cap, with, with a single cap 
if it were it had completely flat response and it's just rolling off at 60 per octave excursion is actually increasing with with decreasing frequency still oh. so it actually starts to distort more and more and more as you feed bass into it and so 12 dB per octave acoustically is is the minimum. Typically tweeters have, because of their resonance and chamber and stuff, have about 12 dB per octave roll off on their own and then the cap adds another 6 dB to that. So you have a combination of something like 12 to 18 dB per octave roll off even with a single cap. Mm -hmm. But why would you want to go steeper than that? Well, um, actually Siegfried Linkwitz has a who unfortunately died a few years ago, has a great website called Linkwitz Lab where they talk about different crossover topologies and describes why he thinks a fourth order filter is best as opposed to a... Yeah, he was big on those steep filters. Yeah, steeper filters. So he sort of innovated work on this fourth order filter and, um, you know, which is 24 dB per octave. So that's probably one of the most common in the industry is that for power handling, uh, you, for the reasons we had talked about earlier, you gain performance, uh, you have lower distortion and higher power handling. And then also you have, when you have less overlap between the drive units, you actually have wider coverage because if you're playing from two sources, the effective source size is larger mm -hmm. where they're overlapping because you have the woofer and the tweeter both playing. And so the effective source size is the center, the center spacing between them. And so if you make that very steep, then at the, the crossover, uh, you have wider coverage, more even coverage. So there's um, that's one of the positives. The negatives would be you have more components in the system, which each have nonlinearities of their own, the caps and the coils and the resistors, and also uh, more expense from, from using high quality versions of those. So there's there, there are design trade-offs there between the number of components and the quality of components. and. It, it, also, the, the materials of the woofers and tweeters sometimes dictate that. If you have a, uh, a woofer cone with a, a, a large resonance, a, a peak in its response, you want to push that down as low as possible. So a steeper filter might be required, where if you have a, a cone with better damping or a dome that can has lower distortion, you can have more gradual filters. So there's Yeah, like we've seen with our 10-inch mid-range, mm -hmm. uh, if you start going down too low, it starts wonking out and, and breaking up and you oh, got to get out of it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that, that's a mid-range that only can be crossed over down to a, a few hundred hertz. It, it doesn't play lower than that yeah. uh, at, at high output, but it, it actually plays out to about 10 kilohertz at high frequency. So you actually can have a more gradual filter on the top end. So there's, there's, there's you know, positives and negatives to each of these kinds of approaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, the crossover is the critical part. Yep. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm.